Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to you each. Obviously, it's a different kind of Sabbath, but a special Sabbath. We get to do this a few times a year when we get to celebrate the uh, Holy Communion, the Last Supper, and the foot washing, the act of humility here today. Um, based on that Sabbath school lesson, I hope you all, I hope we had all of you in Sabbath school this morning. What a great Sabbath school lesson. It sounds to me like I need to break a habit of asking for amens, because we are all encouraged this morning to just start saying amen more while we learn. Amen? amen. There I go, immediately doing it. <laughs> Habits are hard to break, aren't they? And I, purpose, I did not purposefully do that, say ask for an amen, but it was a perfect segue into our service today, our sermon today. Because, of course, as you know, we're doing a series on marriage, 411, obviously marriage information, but also an advanced class. We're specifically focused on marriages 20 years or, or you know, advanced uh, years, 20 or more years of marriage. Because sometimes we can settle, we get to a business, you know, it just becomes through the motions. And I know, I've heard from some of you who are single, that you've also been blessed because we're learning more and more also about all relationships, but also marriage is a symbol of our heavenly relationship. And so we're learning more practical lessons about how to walk closer with Jesus as well, one-on-one -on -one with Him. And so what a great time to have a service that we call communion than during a series where we discuss marriage, because that is coming into Union, to become one flesh, right? So why don't we have a word of prayer and we will get into today's study. Father, we thank you so much for being here again. Lord, we have come to the point where we want to study your word, but we can't do that on our own. It will be pointless. We want your Holy Spirit here. We need your angels to attend to our minds that we may stay focused and energized. We also, Lord, want to work on all relationships, our relationship with you, the relationship with our spouses, our relationship as a church, and our relationship with the community. We want to be able to draw all into union, and so, Lord, we ask that you will walk with us now as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we actually don't know really anything about the battle. It's been lost in history. But what has remained in history is the teaching, the, maybe we'll call it a legend since we don't know the, the, less, the, the facts of it, but what has remained is the legend that one of, if not the greatest military victory in history was fought in Bible times, and it was won by a man named Naaman. Now, we pick up our story of Naaman after the battle. We know he's a great Syrian general. We know that he is well-revered and that he is gathering forces or has gathered forces to fight against Israel. But whatever this battle was, it has taken place before that. But when we add to what we know about Naaman from the Bible, it becomes even more spectacular to know that this man won this amazing battle even though he had a problem, didn't he? And what was Naaman's problem? Leprosy. This man, Naaman, had a terrible, terrible, painful disease. Skin and organs would shut down. Your skin would burn. And body parts would fall off. They would pass. Terrible, terrible, disgusting um, uh, disease. And yet, he worked diligently for his king. When his king needed him, he fought victoriously for his king. And I hope and pray that we all are doing so as well. Don't we all have problems in life? We have problems in life, and some are emotional problems, financial problems, marital problems, maybe it is, you know, diseases that we're battling. We have mighty problems in our world, and yet we are called to the same goal, to fight on the behalf of our king. Amen? 
And to do that, to overcome the problems in life, to overcome the weaknesses in life, we have to have a resolve, right? We have to have a resolve, a purpose, that no matter what, I am going to fight on behalf of my king. I'm going to fight against Satan, fight against sin, fight against temptation. And of course, we do so because the battle belongs to the Lord. But we have to have that purpose, that resolve, that we have to tell ourselves. And that's what we read uh, from our scripture this morning from Psalms, right? Or uh, Yeah, Psalms. It said, I have purposed. I have that resolve. I have told myself. I am not going to do those things. I'm going to stop with those habits, stop with that lifestyle. We have to have the resolve and the determination that we are going to fight on behalf of our king. Naaman did so for his king. How much more great, how much, how greater, how much more awesome is our king? We weren't in Sabbath school this morning, apparently. How much greater is our king? Our king is so much... Maybe that's why we were speechless. We were trying to find a word to describe our king. How do we describe our king, Jesus Christ, the king of kings and lord of lords? But that same resolve... That same purpose must be in our homes as well. Whether we are raising children, grandchildren, whether we are married, whether we have neighbors or siblings that we check in on, or even if it's just spiritual battles in our home, we must have that same resolve today. I am going to love and serve my spouse. I am going to take care of them and dedicate my day to them. We have to have that same resolve. And you know, marriage is an important part of this story. Naaman has leprosy. He fights a great battle in Israel, and he brings home with him a little slave girl, right? An Israelite slave girl who is now going to... He must have brought her home as a present to his wife, right? All right? Some of us go on business trips, and we hit the hotel gift store, or we... Do whatever, right, at the conference, and we buy a little knick-knack, a little thing, we come home, hi, I got you something that says Toronto on it, or whatever. <laughs> he brought her a souvenir, right, he brought her this young girl, and he presented to his wife his souvenir, his reward from the battle, and she was to serve his wife. But then this little girl realizes that Naaman has leprosy, and he needs help. And who does she tell? Does she tell Naaman directly? Let's read it. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl, who is from the land of Israel. Do you see it kind of skips a step in those verses? She told her mistress, right, Naaman's wife, and then he suddenly goes in and tells the king. What step are we missing? But we, it's, it's implied there. His wife told him. His wife found out information about him that would bless him, and she helped him by telling him. You know, we often might forget he has leprosy. Is he the only one who's, maybe this isn't the right word, but for an understanding, is he the only one who's punished by that? What is their marriage must have been like? I don't know, the less, but I can assume, we can all rightfully assume, when was the last time he held her in his arms? He hugged her, he comforted her, he patted her face, he played with her hair. When was the last time that there was any kind of physical attachment between them? We can assume it's been a while, as long as he's had leprosy. And so their marriage is struggling. I would assume at least have this struggle. She found out this information, 
And she went and told her husband and certainly must have encouraged him, you've got to go. Because does Naaman go with the right heart? If you know the story, doesn't he go and he sees the waters, he sees the prophet, what's the heart he has? This can't fix me. This is a waste of time, right? He even wants to go home. You could assume he has this same struggle before. Like, I've got to go all the way there and get this prophet. We have our own prophets. Why can't my prophets help or our prophets help? His wife must have prompted him, you've got to give it a shot. Our marriage is hurting. It's crumbling. We're having troubles. We have this struggle. You've got to go and do something about it. Here's some help. Here's some hope. And he responded with a purpose and a resolve. For you, honey, anything. I'll go to this pagan people who I just defeated in battle. Can you imagine the pride there that he had to swallow? He just defeated them in battle? He just had this warrior moment where he's the greatest and he's better than them, and now he's going to come back and ask them for help? Why would Naaman do so if it wasn't for the purpose of his marriage? They had the same purpose, the same mindset to get him healthy, right? To get him healed. This is the one of the reasons and purposes for marriage. What is the purpose of marriage? Why was it given to us by God himself? We learn the ultimate purpose of marriage when God himself defines it. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. This is not the gospel of Pastor Phil or even the gospel of Adam or Eve. God himself says this, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a what, everyone? A helper comparable to him. So not a servant, not a slave. You know, Ellen White says that she was not created from his foot so that he could stomp on her or from his head so that he, she would be the head of man, but from the rib because they were to be equals. A helper comparable to him. She was to help him live his life to the fullest. This is even before sin. How much more important then is that relationship after sin? Yes? Very important. And he was to help her live her life to the fullest. Stop and just dwell on that for a moment. Meditate on that thought. This is before sin. Wasn't life perfect? Complete? It wasn't, was it? Before Adam and Eve were both created, life was not yet perfect. Listen, the fruit was perfect. The animals were perfect. God said at the end of every day, it is perfect. Good, But here is the only time in the story when he tells us something's not perfect during creation week. It is not good that man should be alone. As soon as Adam was created, something was not perfect in the garden. And that something was that he didn't have his helper comparable to him. It wasn't perfect for Adam until Eve was created. Let that sink in. All of us can learn something, but especially if you're married, let that sink in. That the person you have dedicated your life to, the person that you have combined your life with, makes life, even in the life of following God, they make life even better. And I'm supposed to make my, my wife's life even better. So it's not just, wow, they make my life better. But I have to have a resolve every day, a purpose, a determination every day to live for God and to live for my spouse, my wife, right? It has to be, it's called to be that way. 
In fact, I want you to catch this. Was Adam, let's discount the animals for a moment. And let's even for a second discount that Jesus walked with him. Was Adam outside of Jesus and outside of the animals before Eve was created, was Adam completely alone? Angels walked with him, we learn, right? Angels spoke with him and talked with him. Let's call them friends, good friends, best friends. Was even having a friend good enough? No. Wow. How powerful then can a godly marriage be? In fact, Ellen White says this. Notice page 46 of Patriarchs and Prophets. Even communion with angels could not have satisfied his desire for sympathy and companionship. There was none of the same nature to love and to be loved. By the way, as Adventists, we don't accept the idea that the Nephilim were children of angels and humans, right? And if, you're, if you do go down that road, here's some proof of that. Angels and humans cannot love or be loved by each other in that way. Yes? An angel could not satisfy the needs of Adam in any kind of a relationship. They could be, we could be friends, I'm sure. But Adam needed an Eve, and Eve needed an Adam. Wow. Does that set the bar really incredibly high for the purpose of our marriages? You with me, everyone? At least I hope I can see some heads shake. If you don't want to say anything, can we at least move some heads? Is that an incredibly high bar that has been set by God's word for the purpose of our marriages? Not even angels can fulfill the things that we need from our spouse. Yes. And if you think I've already set the bar high by what we've read, let's set it even higher. This word that's used in Genesis to a helper Comparable. It's one word in the Hebrew. It is always used to describe a marriage or what God does for us. Psalm 70, verse 5. David says, But I am poor and needy. Make haste to me, O God. You are my help. And my deliverer, O Lord, do not delay. Throughout the Old Testament, when it says that God is our helper, it's using that same Hebrew word that's used in Genesis chapter 2 to describe the relationship of Adam and Eve to be helpers comparable to one another. When you are serving and loving and caring for your spouse... You are doing the very work of God. Wow. By the way, that's no different when we are helping people in the community, our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our children, our grandchildren. Doesn't Jesus say that in Matthew 25? As you do unto the least of these, you do unto who? Unto me. When we help other people, when we love other people, when we serve other people, we are doing the very work of God. But doesn't that help us define how important, even whether we're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, whatever our age is, doesn't that tell us that there is something special about that marriage union? We have to have that purpose, though, because I don't feel... Every day of my life, I don't always feel like helping my wife out. Don't tell her I said that. She's not here this morning. I'm spilling secrets for you and you only. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm not alone in the room. And I'm sure I'm not even alone in my marriage. There are days when I'm sure she doesn't want to put up with me. You know, we say opposites attract, correct? And, I, and not every marriage, it's opposites. I happen to be in a marriage that we are absolute opposites in every way. Every way. 
total opposites. And something we have had to resolve, determine, we've had a purpose in our hearts that if we walk with God, the fact that we are so opposite will be a blessing because she will compliment me and I will compliment her. Correct? That her weaknesses are my strengths and my strengths are her... My weaknesses are her strengths. Right? I don't want to only talk about her weaknesses. So, right? So my strengths are good for her and her strengths are good for me. And so as total opposites with God, that's a perfect full circle right there. But when I'm not putting God first in my life or first in my marriage, and when she's not, and when we're opposites, that can cause also a lot of conflict, yeah? Yeah? Maybe I'm speaking to the crowd because maybe you're understanding that. It can cause a lot of conflict. When we are on opposite sides, if we're not walking with God in our selfish moments, we're on opposite teams, aren't we just personality? And so I have to resolve every day, whether I want to or not, I need to resolve, I'm going to love her and help her and strengthen her no matter what, even when I disagree even when I disagree. Because God is like that with his children. Doesn't he help the sinner? So when I'm acting weak, doesn't God help me? And so he helps me when I ask him to. And that same resolve has to be in our marriages, that same purpose. We're going to serve and love each other as we serve God together. Our theme phrase or sentence that we've been focused on in this series, we'll read it again. Ellen White writes this in Signs of the Times, the sweetest type of heaven is a home where the Spirit of the Lord presides. This can be true. Now, this is one of these things that's for everybody, not just in a marriage, right? It doesn't say the sweetest type of heaven is a marriage. It's true, too. But if you're single, widowed, widower, this can still be true for you as well. Amen? Yes. The sweetest type of heaven is a home where the Spirit of the Lord presides. We have to ask God, invite Him into our homes each and every day, have that purpose and resolve that He will be the King of my home. You know, we've had non-Adventists live with us. You know, her brother one time lived with us for a bit, and, and we just had to have that resolve. When he moved in, he was struggling with his life, and he needed a place of, and we said, hey, we know that you don't accept the Lord. He was an, he's an atheist, doesn't want anything to do with God. And we laid out the ground rule, though. When you're in our home, from Friday night to Saturday night, whether we're in the house or not, whether we're awake or not, this TV is off. You don't watch your movies and the violent things you do. You know, he had the habit on other days when, we, when our Felix was tiny, a baby, when Felix would go to bed and we'd go to bed, that's when he'd turn on his movies. They wanted to watch all the violence and the things going on, the R-rated movies. Friday night, we go to sleep, this TV still stays off. Why? Because the sweetest type of heaven is a home where the Spirit of the Lord presides. Does that take resolve and purpose? You have to make that ground that no matter what, we will put God first in this home. God will be first. God needs to dwell in our house. And we serve a God of choice. And God will only preside or reside in our homes if we let him, if we invite him, if we bring him in. Amen? Yeah? And so we have to make that purpose in our home. God dwells here. So we've been learning, and we're about halfway now through our series, these uh, promises or these encouragements of stay. I hope you don't feel condescended by this because it was just a fun way of presenting it, but we've been learning you can't teach an old dog new tricks is not the gospel truth. Amen? Amen. We can learn new tricks. Even if we've had 20, 30 years of bad habits, by God's grace we can learn new habits, right? And so we might be all dogs, but we can learn new tricks. And one of the tricks a dog learns is stay. 
So we're learning to stay calm, to stay passionate, to stay young. We talked about that last time. Today we're learning to stay purposeful. And then we will learn uh, here soon uh, in April to stay in love, to stay flexible, and to stay in a Sabbath rest. To stay purposeful. It's a mindset to purpose in our hearts. I love my spouse. We will put God first in our homes. Every day we will spend time in prayers, time in study. We will put God in our homes. Purposeful means to stay engaged, to purposefully make time, to be attentive, and to be involved in each other's lives. When we first got, boy, when I was in Bishop, the Bishop District, the last district, two and a half years ago, I thought I was busy. And I would complain all the time to my wife, I can't believe how busy I am, I can't believe how busy I am. And then we moved to the Yuma District. <laughs> and you had to teach an old dog new tricks. If I thought I was busy then, I'm busy now. And in uh, 2021 is when we moved here, and our, our anniversary is June 22. We moved here July 1st. And so we said, as soon as we get unpacked, we're going to celebrate our anniversary. Since we were packing during our anniversary, we're going to celebrate it. By the time we celebrated that one, that was our 19th anniversary, it was like December. <laughs> and then in 2022, it was like October. A little better. Last year it was July. It was only one month late because of our schedules. But my poor wife, we spent the whole weekend in Sedona and she was sick the whole time. So this time we decided to get ahead of it. And so we just spent three days in San Diego, relaxing, spending time together, ignoring texts and phone calls. But we had to be purposeful to do that. I'm busy, she's busy. Our lives are busy. And Satan, I should add, did not want this to happen. In the days leading up to our vacation, I, can't, I won't even take all the time I need to think about all the crazy things that happened in our home. The things breaking down, the problems we had, all kinds of issues. Literally, our house was overflowing with sewage the day before we left. Because we're in a massive neighborhood of sewer, of everyone is connected to the sewer. No one ever told us that there's a small square grid of homes on septic tanks in this big neighborhood by the college. We happened to be in a, we had no idea we had a septic tank. So it's been at least three years, and we, I don't know, I've never heard of this, but we have a filter, some of you might know this, we have a, you know, the septic tank needs to be cleaned every three or four years, but we have a filter in the septic tank that has to be cleaned once a year. Never heard of anything like that in my life. Well, it's been almost three years since it's been cleaned. Voila, the problem. But it didn't happen a month ago, two months ago, it happened the day before we were leaving on our trip. You think we wanted to call off the trip? Absolutely, it cost us a lot of money. Oh boy, should we go and now spend this money and eating out and having, going? we went to the zoo on Thursday in San Diego, should we be doing all this? And we sat down, we looked at each other and we said, absolutely yes, we need this. We have to stay purposeful and engaged. We have to make time, no matter the problems that Satan is throwing at us, we have to stay purposeful in our marriage. We have to. We have to do what it takes to be helpful to one another. And this was her spring break from Yaks, right? It was on spring break, and I was able to take it. So absolutely, no doubt, let's go, no matter what. Purposeful. You think God, the Godhead, has purpose and resolve and determination? To be our help? I mean, come on. 
if there's ever been an adulterous wife in the history of this universe, it's our planet. Yes? Yes. We don't deserve God's love. He has, they have had to stay purposeful and resolved. We will love them and serve them and help them no matter what. Psalms 46, 1. God is, not might be, not maybe, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. You catch that? A very present, and there's that word, same Hebrew word as the marriage, that Eve would be a help comparable to Adam. God is not just to help sometimes, not just when we deserve it. Hello, marriages. How It's easy to love the person when they deserve it, yeah? You're too scared to answer that question? I'll say it for you then. It's easy to love your spouse when they deserve it. But we need to be an ever, a very present help, even if we feel they don't deserve it, even on their bad days. Yes. A very present help in trouble. I remember years ago, I don't even remember the topic, as almost all fights are, you, two days later you have no idea. In fact, sometimes you're in the fight, you have no idea what started it. You have no idea why you're arguing, but you know you're right. <laughs> but I remember years ago, we were in the middle of a, a big one. Two days, it wasn't two days completely of, you know, fighting, but it was two days of quiet. We're not, you know, just stay away till we figure this out. Right in the middle of it. We were having a conversation at that point. Right in the middle of it, we got a call that my wife's cousin passed away. You think I responded with, well, now that you're off the phone, let's continue this conversation. And she said, I don't even remember the issue. And, and, you know, I'm sorry about Brandon. Okay, bye, Dad. Phil, I told you to get your shoes off the table or whatever the issue was. What do you think we immediately did? Clung to one another instantly. It was over. Conversation, discussion, dead. A very present help in trouble. They have to come first. It's another story in the New Testament of a marriage covenant that may have been having trouble. You heard of the guy Pontius Pilate? And he had to make a big decision, a very big decision, whether or not Jesus was guilty of the crimes that they were were claiming he did. And it's just a small mention, but if you read it too quickly, you miss it, that his wife was a helper comparable to him. She was a very present help in the day of trouble. Matthew 27, 19. While he, that's Pontius Pilate, was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today, in a dream because of him. What does she call Christ? A just man. See, there's a little bit more to that story that we can learn in Desire of Ages, that she had actually been following, or I should say paying attention to Jesus for a while. She knew quite a bit about him and what he had been doing. And before he even showed up in the judgment, she had been telling Pilate about him. And so now that she sees and hears that he's on trial, her heart is bothered, her spirit is stirring. Who do you think is stirring her heart? It's the Holy Spirit, right? It's stirring her heart. All those things that she's learned, all those seeds that have been planted, it's working now in her heart. He's watering the seeds that have been planted. And so she's tossing and turning at night, stressing and struggling, and thinking and dreaming about this. And so while Pontius Pilate is on the judgment seat, she sent to him. Life lesson for us, right there. How often have I said to my wife, I'm too busy, get back to me later. If there's ever a time for someone to say to his wife, I'm busy, leave me alone. Maybe it's while he's sitting on the judgment seat. 
But even the wicked Pontius Pilate knows to make time for his wife. When she calls for him, and she doesn't wait either, they both come together to discuss this. Notice how Desire of Ages presents this. 724. Christ's appearance made a favorable impression upon Pilate. His better nature was roused. He had heard of Jesus and his works. His wife had told him something of the wonderful deeds performed by the Galilean prophet who cured the sick and raised the dead. So this isn't the first time he's heard of Jesus. The Holy Spirit had already planted seeds in his heart through his wife, who had already, even though we're assuming they're both pagan believers, we know they're pagan, she's been stirred by this, and she's been telling him of the wonderful prophet. Even in a pagan home, they're coming together as a helper comparable to one another. But why? Because the Holy Spirit is dwelling there, trying to move upon both hearts. Yes? Is the Holy Spirit moving on in Christian homes? And so we need to come together with that purpose and resolve. And she has resolve. She doesn't say, hey, maybe. She says, do not have anything to do with this just man. She shows purpose. But here's where we can learn a lesson. Does he listen to her? He does not listen to her. Rather than listen to his wife, what does he do? He doesn't want to take it on himself. So he can go home and say, honey, it wasn't me. My hands were clean of it. Don't be mad at me, babe. It's not me. It was them who decided. I gave them the choice. And he doesn't listen to her. And in the book, Daughters of God, Ellen has a whole section about Pontius Pilate's wife. And and about Pilate, she, she writes this. If Pilate had followed his conviction, remember it was there because of his wife, he would have had nothing to do with condemning Jesus. The Holy Spirit was trying to reach the heart of a pagan ruler through his wife. And he didn't listen to his wife. He didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. Wives, take that with you. When you speak, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. (laughs) But he didn't. He didn't listen. And history tells us not long after this, he would be killing himself, ruining not only his spiritual eternity, but his marriage. She had to live with that, that he did that. There was a a moment, I was, I'll tell you a story that happened in the first two years or so of ministry. I didn't handle it very well. So as I tell you the story, don't think I'm telling you to act like me. I didn't handle it very well. But I was doing Bible studies with a young a young lady, she was 19 years old or so, and she started coming around a lot to youth events and young adult events, and she was preparing for baptism. My wife started to say to me, patiently at first, something's given me the weird feeling about her. Be careful. No, 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 it's just, it's just Bible study, just Bible study. And so sometimes, you know, we, when the other one's not listening, we have to try again and a little bit more stern maybe next time. So I remember having this card, and my wife was very certain, very purposeful. This girl has a weird, there's something going on. This is not, this may just be, I remember saying, this may just be Bible study to you. This is not just Bible study to her. You've got to be careful with her. And so it did, it turned into not a big fight, but an argument. But uh, by the end, I said, all right, fine. If I remember saying this to her, if you don't care about this girl's salvation, I will stop studying with her. So I went to work the next day, resolved to, all right, I have to put a stop to it. The girl had a Bible study that morning. Again, I wasn't handling this very well. Senior pastor wasn't in. Secretary wasn't in. The only person in was the janitor. So I went to the janitor. I said, I've got a really weird request. I know this isn't your job, but my wife has said that this girl has bad purposes and intents. I'm not supposed to talk to her. 
Would you please, I'm so embarrassed to say this, would you please, when she shows it, this is, she didn't have a cell phone. This is still like 2003. Not everyone has cell phones back then, so I had to wait for her to come in. Would you please tell her that I won't be doing Bible studies anymore, and when the senior pastor is in, I'll be referring her to him so he could follow up with her. And I, I literally said it with like annoyance in my voice. Like, this is so silly, but I'm, I'm listening to my wife. All right. So when the time came that she was shown for a Bible study, I went on a walk. I came back, and the janitor met me in my office, and he said, I thought your request was really dumb. Me too, me too, I said. But when I told, I, he didn't even go into detail why. He just said that the senior pastor would start doing the Bible studies with her. He says, she freaked out. She started screaming at me. I have to see Phil. I have to see Phil. I need him in my life. I love him. I want him here in my life. And that was the day I learned. You've got to pay attention to the feelings of your spouse. Often, right? Who's going to know how a young woman is feeling better than a young woman? My wife was tuned into something that I wasn't tuned into. And so I didn't do it with a cheerful heart. I didn't do it because I wanted to. I went in sarcastically and moaning and complaining. But she was right. She's not always right. <laughs> but she's, she's off, more often right than I am, though. But it was important that we had that purpose. That I went in, and I've learned since then that when I wanted, when I'm doing something for my wife, to do it with meaning. Because you know what was the surprise? Was when I came back home and to tell her what happened, she didn't gloat over me. I was right, you were wrong, but she was upset with me because of the way I had acted. And I think it was totally fair. Because I had said to her the night before, well, if you don't care about her salvation, then fine, you know. I heard her. I didn't have the resolve and the determination to serve my wife before other people. It's important for us to listen and love and share. Yeah. Our marriages are places of teamwork. Helpers comparable to one another. We're, we're almost done and then we'll have our communion time. Acts 18 is a wonderful example between husband and wife. This man, this is Apollo uh, in, in the book of Acts, had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla, it's a husband and wife, heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. To be joint workers together for God at church or at the, in the home, we are called to be helpers comparable to one another. And yes, again, not just spouses, but every single one of us is called in this church to be a helper comparable to the person around you. Yeah? And what is communion all about? We wash each other's feet. You might come into that with a heart like I did in that story. All right, whatever, I got to do it. You think that's going to make foot washing the ordinance of humility? Because you do it just because you have to do it? Come together, wash one another's feet, serve one another, love one another. And then we all, in an organized way, we pass out all the emblems and we remember together what Christ has done for us. We are Protestants, happy Protestants. We don't believe in salvation by works. So if we do the things that we do today simply because we have to, simply because we're supposed to, what good does it do? 
It doesn't do us any good. We have to come with a purposed heart, a resolved heart, a determined heart, to trust and believe that Jesus has died, his body was broken, his blood was shed, and he served the disciples and still is serving us today as our high priest, and that is why we serve one another. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 28, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in the, uh, of the Lord in an unworthy manner, in other words, without purpose and reason, you just do it because you're supposed to, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Resolve. Think about it. Examine yourself. While we wash each other's feet, think about what you're doing, what it means, how you're serving, what you need to get cleansed from your... Oh, when you're being washed, when your feet are being washed, be prayerfully considering and determined. What things am I washing away through Jesus Christ? What things am I leaving here in this... And you know, we had a joke last time as we practiced as elders, deacons, and deaconesses that the emblems, uh, as we bless them, they get disposed of in certain ways. I don't know if you know that. If you, don't, if you never served as, a, as one of those leadership positions, you may not know that the bread gets buried or burned, the grape juice after it's blessed gets poured onto a living tree to provide life, but the water in the, in the foot washing bowls, guess what that happens? Guess what that gets? Just gets thrown out. Well, why? That represents the body of Jesus. What does the water represent? Sin. It's washed away our sins. We just toss it out the door. It goes down the storm drain. Right? That's what we're getting washed as we do this. We go first to the ordinance of humility and we repent while we're in there. And then because we've done that, we come in here and celebrate that Jesus has died for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's... Go about this with purpose and resolve and determination, whether we're talking about our marriages, our family units, our work as evangelists in the community, or even as we serve one another in communion. Let us go about this with purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, so much for your purpose and resolve, the Godhead's determination to help, to seek, Father, we ask that you will help us each do that as well. Bless the marriages that are struggling. Bless the marriages that need this connection, this communion. Bless the relationships in this room, Lord, that might also need to find healing and strength from past issues or past dramas. Help us, Father, come into union through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.